it is that they say morality is concerned to maximize. So for example, um, some say what's intrinsically good and therefore to be maximized by morality is a feeling of happiness. Others say it's a feeling of pleasure. Others say it's utility defined as the, some kind of mathematical measure of the satisfaction of preferences, whether we have a psychological feeling of pleasure or happiness or not. Um, and there are other teleological theories. Others say that um, what's good is the feeling of pleasure, but that there are different kinds of pleasures, some more intrinsically valuable than others. Okay, so all of these are going to have a teleological structure, but differ from one another based on what they identify as good. And they all have the feature of the good being identified without moral principles, without being able to have a prior filter over which ones count in the calculation and which ones don't. OK. Um, as we will see, Kant's ethics is not teleological. It's the leading example of a deontological theory. So he holds, Kant holds, that there is no way to identify what's valuable, what is good, unless we already have moral principles about, uh, available to, to use. So we're not going to be able to get any, for Kant, we're not going to be able to get any kind of naturalistic, maybe, uh, characterization of what things are good, what things are valuable, without bringing in moral assessments. There's no assessment of value that can be done prior to utilizing moral principles. So this should generate a puzzle. Uh, Namely, what's the source of those moral principles? What's the source of those moral standards? So back with the teleological theory, there's a kind of natural answer to that, a kind of obvious answer. Why should we comply with this moral principle, with a utilitarian moral principle? Well, the utilitarian can say, because that's what's going to produce the most good. That's what's going to produce the most value. So the moral principle for, for a teleological theory, the moral principle gets uh, generated from a prior account of what's valuable. That kind of story is not available to a deontological theory. So, so you might worry, well, where do these principles come from? Or what's the point of them if not to produce as much value as possible. Um, so, right, so there's a, I mean, there's a worry here about answering the question, what's the point of morality, if not to produce what's valid, to produce what's good. Um, so, the point or source of morality in deontological theory is going to be a little bit less clear. We'll have to worry about this. Um, for Kant, I, I'm not going to give you the answer right now, but for Kant, um, it's going to be tied up with the idea of freedom. As opposed to happiness or satisfaction. OK, um, let me see if there are questions about this. So this was kind of abstract. I want to make sure you understand this structure because Kant will, um, Kant's theory will be in sharp contrast to that. Questions about that? Okay. So you'll notice that I've contrasted here deontology with um, tele teleology. Sometimes in intro ethics classes, you may be introduced to the idea of deontology, but it's contrasted not with T 
teleological theories, as I've just described them, but with something called consequentialism. And so, um, uh, so I need to talk a little bit about that. I feel a responsibility to tell you what consequentialism is, even though it doesn't really figure very much in my understanding of Kant's ethics. So I, I, I do need to talk about what people mean by this idea. Um, because uh, very often uh, in ethics classes, utilitarianism is introduced not as what I've been describing as a teleological theory, but as a form of consequence. And then Kant is sometimes introduced as an alternative to consequentialism. So Kant is introduced as a form of non-consequentialism, sometimes also called deontological. So this is all very confusing. I just want to try to sort this out. Um, sometimes it's said that, so sorry, so consequentialism is supposed to be a theory that's concerned, a moral theory that says in order to make moral assessments, what we are supposed to look at is well, the consequences, the consequences of an action. And so, so utilitarianism is supposed to be a form of consequentialism because it says we're supposed to look at the consequences of our action, of an action, make a moral assessment based on those, rather than, well, it's not exactly clear rather than what the consequences rather than sometimes people say like the act itself or something like that or sometimes people say maybe the intention of the act this seems this all seems to me a little bit misleading um, and really not so much what's fundamental because it's true that for Kant um, we Kant thinks that we cannot make a moral assessment of an action, let's say, simply by looking at the consequences alone. And it's true that in some sense utilitarianism does say that we're supposed to look at something like the consequences alone. But the important point that I want to emphasize is that uh, is, is how utilitarianism answers the question, which consequences are we supposed to look at? And the answer is, that we're supposed to look for utilitarianism, we're supposed to look at happiness or utility or pleasure or desire satisfaction, all understood in pre-moral terms. Okay. Um, still, I want to say something about what people mean by consequentialism because I just said that Kant thinks we cannot make moral assessments based on consequences alone. Okay. Um, so what is it about utilitarianism that people pick out as a form of consequentialism? Um, I've been emphasizing that it tells us to maximize the production of what it identifies as some free moral good, happiness or pleasure or satisfaction. Um, but a slightly different way of making the same point is to say that for a utilitarian, it doesn't matter how that goodness, that happiness, that pleasure, that satisfaction is produced. The means or the path that we take to the production of that good doesn't matter from the point. So that's what people mean by uh, calling utilitarianism a form of consequentialism. What matters is how much goodness, how much happiness, how much satisfaction, how much pleasure is produced at the end of the day as a result of the action, not what path is followed to take this. Um, so here's an example to try to bring out uh, the sense in which Utilitarianism looks at the consequences alone. That is, it looks at the states of affairs that are the outcome of 
the actions that we're considering in terms of the levels of happiness or satisfaction in them, again, understood in non-moral terms and makes a comparison based on which state of affairs would have the most of that good. Okay? All right, so here's the example. Um, suppose down at Albany Med, um, there's a person waiting for a heart transplant, um, another person waiting for a liver transplant, two other people need kidneys, and a fifth needs the pancreas. Suppose all five of them would, li would live full and healthy lives if they received these necessary organs, full and healthy lives at a normal level of happiness or satisfaction, normal length, but there aren't sufficient organs, they'll die soon if they don't get them the next day. Um, this is not unrealistic. So far. And suppose that you break your leg, you're not one of them, but you break your leg and you are transported down to Albany Med to get it set. And by a lucky coincidence, your organs are a perfect match for all five of those patients. Now, suppose you agree that uh, maybe you're a utilitarian, or maybe you agree that life is something intrinsic and objectively valuable. Um, so, well, look, um, now from an impartial point of view, maybe an impersonal point of view, what morality would seem to require is that we produce as much of that valuable stuff as possible, as much of life as possible, or as much utility as possible distributed um, wherever it, it lands. So it sure is unfortunate for you. It sure is unfortunate for your level of happiness that you're a good match for all five of these needy people. Um, but it sure is fortunate, not just for one or two or three or four, but for all five of them, that you are a good match. Um, so from a utilitarian point of view, from a consequentialist point of view, sacrificing your organs to save those other five people would have a decrease in utility and goodness and value because you're losing your life. But there's going to be a five times increase in overall, uh, I guess four times increase in overall happiness um, because other people are sick. <coughs> so um, we should obviously harvest your organs and save those other five people. Okay, so these are the choices here. Uh, kill the one in order to save the five. <coughs> or don't kill the one, and as a result, don't save the five. And if you look at the sort of net outcomes of these choices, there's going to be here, if you kill the one, if we kill the one to save the five, there's going to be five alive and one dead. Over here, obviously, if we let, if we spare that one, well, that one will stay alive, you will stay alive, but we're going to let those five die. So overall, the way to maximize the best consequences here would be to choose A, to kill the one and save the five. Um, so again, from a utilitarian point of view, uh, if we assume that, again, each would have an equally happy life, so the levels of utility, happiness for each of the individuals, the one and each of the five are the same, then the choice is pretty obvious. In fact, now that I mention it, um, if there is an opportunity to save five by killing one, why wait until that one breaks his leg? Why not have I don't know, a registry for everybody's blood type and organ type so that when the need arises, Albany Med is going to send out an ambulance to collect the person.